Chin. This is uh, Mary Shantarani from Gandhi Gram Rural Institute. Artificial intelligence. Actually, it's an introductory section to artificial intelligence. So we all know that uh, AI has conquered our, uh, every walk of life, including healthcare, education, agriculture, security, etc. So it is the buzzword nowadays today. So not only uh, so the applications of AI is not restricted to a small subset. So its applications is uh, increasing is, uh, because of its robustness and its ability. It has a lot of potential to find solutions even to uh, complex problems. So uh, that led to the popularization of artificial intelligence. And nowadays, there are a lot of opportunities for data scientists and uh, analysts using artificial intelligence in all uh, MNCs. So that's dry, it, it uh, remains the driving force of all applications, of all automated applications today. So uh, this session will focus on the basics of artificial intelligence. So actually, uh, I'm just, I'll touch upon the key ideas behind the design of artificial neural network. So uh, my presentation will be organized in this, uh, and that is, uh, first we'll talk about the evolution of artificial intelligence and then the applications. I'll start with machine learning and then uh, finally I'll end up with this uh, deep learning and AI. So we all know that this artificial intelligence, it's a, uh, it refers to an area of computer science that involves or that uh, deals about the creation of intelligent machines. So it uh, includes the development of computer systems where we can perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence. Say, uh, for example, so uh, the question arises, so what kind of problems can be solved by artificial intelligence? So there is so much hype around artificial intelligence. So what are the types of problems? So how do you differentiate? How do you uh, decide which problems can be solved by artificial intelligence? So we can categorize the problems into two types. That is non-AA problem and AA problem. So non-AA problems normally be structured. So we know the structure of the problem and then the problem could be solved by writing a, a structured algorithm. So a simple algorithm is like finding the factorial, right? Or generating the Fibonacci sequence or just generating the payroll. So we know the exact procedure. So those are all structured algorithmic problems which uh, we call it as non-AA problems. So such, uh, such uh, problems can be solved better using machines than compared to human beings. But there are some problems which are totally unstructured and unpredictable, unexpected, unanticipated, we can say. So for such unanticipated problems, it's very difficult to write a structured algorithm. So that is, if, uh, the con we may write an algorithm for addressing one problem. So the problem may, may come in a different way. So we have multiple ad hoc uh, possibilities. So such kind of problems can be easily solved by artificial intelligence. So such uh, problems are, uh, so a problem can be, uh, refer uh, can be referred to the problems where that cannot be easily solved by human beings. Sorry, that cannot be easily solved by machines. So uh, the key features of AI problems would be there is no particular deterministic algorithm. Say, for example, if you are writing an algorithm to identify the spam emails. So we'll be analyzing the possibilities occurring at, at the up to this particular day, but who knows the hackers may devise a new technique to send a spam email. So here the solutions or the possibilities are ad hoc. So they are unanticipated. So there is no deterministic algorithm. So they don't have a fixed solution. And then it will be individual specific. Suppose now we are writing a 
you are writing an algorithm for a uh, product recommendation so the product recommendation for a cosmetic thing may not be similar to a car may not be the same for a car recommendation or a movie recommendation so it will be problem specific so problem specific solutions will be better represented by artificial intelligence solved by artificial intelligence and then prediction problems based on past and existing patterns and then say, recognizing a three dimensional object from a given scene or handwriting recognition so handwriting recognition you know each one of us will have a different handwriting so if uh, the uh, algorithm is meant for recognizing say typed letters then it may not uh, the or uh, letters typed by one person may not be similar may not be may not work well for another person so these are all unexpected problems with unexpected uh, possibilities so those kind of problems can be easily solved by artificial intelligence so there are so many applications now uh, so recent this ai based innovations so we all know that artificial intelligence has revolutionized the field of autonomous vehicles autonomous dri driving so this amazon tesla they are some of the significant players in this uh, in the design of art, uh, autonomous vehicles so <coughs> tesla has introduced one supercomputer and then beidou has uh, introduced driverless taxi services amazon also has uh, ventured into the self driving truck up truck startup and then healthcare so the uh, large number the most important part of artificial intelligence innovations are in healthcare so recent i am just uh, listing all the recent innovations ai based innovations in healthcare so this alpha fold v2 they are able to predict the three dimensional structure of proteins accurately which is considered as a milestone in the field of cell biology similarly is uh, university of liverpool they liverpool they are able to predict associations between viruses and mammalian species and also researchers from japan they have introduced dpact an ai system for differentiating productive and healthy stem cells so which can be used for growing new tissues so this case uh, this very is an important innovation where, uh, where the physicians may be able to grow new organs and then in space so we have uh, so uh, they, they are able to so they are able to scan the moon surface and specifically uh, the nasa's goddard space flight center they have developed a software called as raisa that is research in artificial intelligence for spacecraft resilience so this uh, particular uh, software it uses artificially it applies artificial intelligence to diagnose faults in spacecrafts so so the artificial intelligence the term artificial intelligence is not new actually if you trace the evolution of artificial intelligence it dates back to 1950s and then during between 1980s machine learning evolved followed by deep learning so machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence and deep learning again is a subset of is an outgrowth of machine learning so if we say learning so what do you mean by learning i have shown two images right the first one uh, i have shown two images immediately i'm uh, i'm pretty sure that you will all answer the question uh, answer uh, which what image or what are these images so the first image is taj mahal and then second image is a peacock a beautiful peacock so how do you know that it is a peacock how do you immediately say that it is a peacock there is a, if you uh, analyze this you might have heard about this peacock earlier you might have seen this image in your book or you might have seen you might have directly seen a peacock maybe in a farm or uh, in a forest etc so when you see the peacock for the first time your brain builds a model out of it so what do you mean by a model so we say that model means it uh, observes it extracts the features from this image say in this case a peacock its neck is uh, blue 
and then it has uh, colored uh, wings, right? And then it's a beautiful uh, thing. And the Taj Mahal, you can say it's a white color, white color uh, building. And then it is uh, all full, uh, built of marbles. So whenever your brain sees an object for the first time, it builds a model with the features. So when you show the same, when you learn, see this uh, same object again, using that model, your brain will be able to answer, hey, this is peacock. It matches, the features matches to a peacock. Similarly, yeah, this uh, this uh, Taj Mahal, I have visited this. So I already know. So this, uh, this is the learning. So learning is the cap capability or you can say intelligence. So what is intelligence? So learning is understanding intelligence. What do you mean by intelligence? It's the capability to acquire and apply knowledge. So it learns some abstractions. It learns the features from the data. So machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence concerned with the design and development of algorithms that allow computers to learn. So machine learning is as a subject that deals with the learning and evolving behaviors based on the given data. So learning abstractions from data that is done by machine learning. So normally a traditional program, we give the input data and then we give a program. We just write a program and then we get the output. But on the other hand, machine learning, we provide both the data and the output, right? So we, we feed both the data and the output. So uh, uh, the output would be, a set of rules or the model. So the output will be a model in case of machine learning. So you'll better understand. So here, uh, say said features. Features are des descriptors. You can say that features are the parameters that describe an object. So we can call them as descriptors. So here there are two images of horses. The first one is a horse, just a plain horse. The second one is a zebra. So we say that it is a brown horse. And the second one is a zebra. How do you identify that it is a horse and the second one is a zebra? We say the shape. First, by looking at the shape, we say it is a horse. It is a horse. Second one, it looks like a horse, but the texture, it has stripes, black and white stripes on its body. So whenever a horse with black and white stripes, we call it as a zebra. So these are the features. So features may be the shape or the color of an object, or the texture. So like here, this black and white stripes. So a model is built using the features. So when, so this is the basic idea of acquiring intelligence. So humans, they use the same uh, procedure, same process. By just looking at the features, by looking at an object, they grasp the features that describe that object and builds a, a model is built. So the same analogy, same process is applied in machine learning. So we give the training images, features are extracted, we train. So the more the, uh, the training labels. So here in machine learning, there are two types uh, we'll learn about the, uh, later. So different types of learning. So in general, the more machine learning framework could be, we'll be given, there will be a training set, training set full of images. So from the training set, we'll be extracting images based on the image features we train, and then we provide the labels also. So the outcome will be a model, learned model. So now when you give a new image, so with the given data set, we have constructed a model, and then you test the model with a test image. So from the test image, we extract the image features, and then the learned model will predict that this is an apple. So this is the fundamental uh, process that uh, works out in any machine learning algorithm. So this machine learning framework can be expressed as a equation. Y is equal to F of X. X is the input. F is the prediction function. Y is the output. So we know in case of supervised learning, we know both X and Y. So we'll be learning this F. So given a, a training set of labeled examples, X1, Y1, we know this is a for uh, the input x1, we get the output y1. So we estimate the prediction function. 
see the output of any machine learning framework will be a prediction function so this uh, machine learning can be applied to any uh, data set so in agriculture data set if you apply in agriculture you will be given a set of uh, leaf images and the uh, disease so this kind of image this kind of leaf is affected by this kind of disease right so we give different kinds of uh, leaf the uh, leaf images with different diseases the model will be trained suppose if we give a new leaf image immediately the model will predict that this particular leaf is affected by a particular disease so uh, this is the basic idea so as uh, visually uh, represented by this prediction function so we see f of apple will return that it is an apple and then tomato etc normally we have different types of machine learning so supervised learning unsupervised learning semi supervised learning reinforcement learning right so uh, in supervised learning so uh, we have a uh, machine learning can be categorized as different types of learning that is supervised and supervised reinforcement and uh, semi supervised so supervised learning if you see this image a picture so we know so all similar objects they are grouped here in supervised learning we give the labels so the training data set will have the data along with the labels we know that is suppose we have cats and dogs the training images we know we uh, if it's a cat image there will be a label corresponding this is a cat this is a dog so we provide both the data as well as the labels to the machine learning framework whereas in case of unsupervised learning we we have no prior idea about the data so we have no uh, we don't understand the properties of the data but the learning algorithm will itself will uh, learn the inherent properties or the intrinsic properties of the data shared and then group them according to the similarity so that is unsupervised learning in semi supervised learning it is a mix of the training data set will have a mix of both uh, labeled data as well as unlabeled data by labeled data we mean images with their respective labels cat means that comes with a cat label dog image comes with a dog label in addition to that we'll be having some unlabeled data so you may ask what is the significance or what are the advantages of semi supervised learning normally labeled data are more expensive because given the data we need to label we need to annotate an image that it is a cat so that annotation process is time consuming so normally this labeled data will be expensive and compared to unlabeled data so when you put a smaller amount when you use a smaller amount of labeled data along with a large amount of uh, unlabeled data we get the same result but with a less cost so that is the advantage of semi supervised learning so the uh, supervised learning the training data is accomplished by labels so uh, if you look at this machine learning framework for supervised learning you could see the training data set the data along with the labels is fed to the machine learning algorithm the output will be a predictive model when you give a new text or new uh, image with no label the predictive model will give the expected label so the supervised learning takes both the data as well as the labels as input normally the supervised learning example so where can apply uh, supervised learning normally it's well suited for classification and numerical prediction process so again may uh, ask what is the difference between classification and numeric prediction normally both uh, are based on supervised learning but classification they work on categorical data or discrete data numeric prediction they use continuous data so classification pro process predicts categorical class labels what do you mean by categorical data like uh, say if you are given an image we you classify it as a car or if say if you are cat or dog right so we, we specify it is a cat it is a dog it is a car 
so discrete labels suppose uh, if you are giving a, a, a tumor image a medical image you just classify it as a, an image with tumor or uh, no tumor so we give the, the the labels are discrete but on the other hand prediction is it models continuous valid functions say like uh, given the features of a house you predict its price so the prediction will be a numeric value so we call it as numeric prediction so this numeric pred prediction uh, normally regression so the uh, popular technique for numeric prediction is regression it models continuous valued functions so these are two important uh, uh, applications of supervised learning classification and numeric prediction classification predicts categorical class labels so how it works so normally classification works by it has two steps first model construction second one is model usage so it constructs a model that describes the set of predetermined classes say for example dog if you want to classify it as a dog it uh, learns it learns all the uh, it learns about the uh, dog image and then it identifies the features so all these uh, dog images share these common features and then all the cat images share these common features right so based on that it builds a model so when you give a new image it just classifies so classification is a two-step process a model construction and model usage so uh, in a, any there's a machine learning process we divide the input data into two sets training set and test data set normally training set we use like 60 to 80 percent and then for testing we just use 10 to 20 percent so given the data set we first divide into training and testing so with the model is constructed using the training data set and then it is tested using the test data set so how do you estimate the accuracy of any machine learning model we use the accuracy the most common evaluation metric is accuracy so it is a percentage of test set samples that are correctly classified by the model so out of uh, the given set of uh, test samples how many sample have been correctly classified so that is, uh, we estimate the accuracy. When the accuracy is acceptable or if it is perfect, then it could be used for, uh, it, will, it will be deployed for real life application. So this is an example for uh, model construction. So we are given the data, from the data, this is the training data, we just uh, apply classification algorithm where the, outcome will be a classifier so what is the classifier the model could be a set of if then rules or it could be a decision tree so model by me uh, what we mean is it could be a set of uh, if then rules or it could be a decision tree or it could be a neural network but uh, in this case we have the model is represented by if then rules so from the set of from the data set from the training data set this model comes out with this if then rule that is if rank is equal to professor or years is greater than six then tenured is equal to yes so here tenured is a label class label so our uh, tenured is a class label it has two values yes or no so it's classification process so the label class labels are discrete so now having given this training data set we have constructed a classifier a model now we can use the test data set now from the test data set, we have Tom, Aston Professor. So what is the rule? Either the rank should be greater, should be equal to professor, or the year should be greater than six. Only then tenure will be equal to yes. So here, George, professor, so it satisfies the first condition. So the class label is yes. Joseph, assistant professor, but years is greater than six, so tenure is equal to yes. But Melissa, associate professor. Here, the uh, number of years is greater than six, but the model has wrongly classified as no. So this is uh, so. What is the accuracy of this model? Out of four records, four uh, records in the test data, one record has been wrongly classified. So one by four. 
So the accuracy of this model is 80 percent because out of four, uh, because only one has been wrongly classified. So this uh, accuracy of this uh, data model classifier is 80 percent. So if 80 percent is uh, uh, acceptable, then you can use it for predicting other unknown cases. So this is about classification. So normally we have this another example. See the loan applicants details. So we build a classifier model. So based on the applicants information, we just choose whether we classify them potential defaulters or potential non defaulters. Potential defaulters means those who buy those who get the loan and then they don't repay. So they are considered as defaulters. So this binary classifier model classify the given set of loan applicants based on the <coughs> based on the characteristics shared by all the defaulters. So examples of supervised learning, it could be used for credit risk assessment, disease diagnosis, and then compressive strength prediction in construction, automatic steering wheel. Suppose we are given the images of the steering wheel based on that, you can say how far the, based on the images in front of the car, the system, the automatic system will decide how, how much degree the steering wheel should be turned. Unsupervised learning, it's learning what normally happens. There is no pre, there are no predefined labels, right? So it is a, it has no prior knowledge about the data. Just groups the data based on some similarity metrics. So this is unsupervised learning. Why do we say it is unsupervised learning? Because we don't provide any label. We don't say, given the cat images, we don't say that it is a cat or dog. We just give a set of mixed images. The algorithm itself finds groups based on the similarity. So normally this uh, unsupervised learning, so you could see the uh, framework. We don't provide the labels, class labels for the training data. So we just uh, give the training set and then features are extracted. Machine learning algorithm builds a model and then a new image or document given, it uh, finds the cluster ID. So this is unsupervised learning. Hope you understood the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. So supervised learning, we provide both data and the class labels. For unsupervised learning, we provide only the data, not the labels. The algorithm itself finds groups the data based on the similarity. So we could see the difference between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Here the input data comes with annotations. These are apples. But uh, in the second one, unsupervised learning, we don't give the labels. So what are the applications of clustering? We have uh, just uh, by the, it has uh, applications in almost all the fields, in the field of biology, and then uh, for uh, information retrieval, in land use, for marketing. We identified uh, specific groups, specific groups of customers who are interested in a particular product, and then city for city planning, and then climate. So predicting the climate based on the patterns based on the parameters, input parameters like atmospheric pressure, etc. Semi-supervised learning, we improve the quality of learning by combining labeled and unlabeled data. Because as I said earlier, unlabeled data is cheaper. So a mix of labeled and unlabeled data without compromising the performance will minimize the cost. So for such applications, we may use semi-supervised learning. Reinforcement learning. We just learn from our feedback, learn via experience. That is the uh, key word for this reinforcement learning key sentence. So we uh, say, for example, we try one new dish at home. So based on the feedback from the family members, we try to refine it during our next uh, preparation. So we learn via feedback. So that is reinforcement learning. 
So again, what are the applications of these two different types of learning, supervised learning, or best well suited for classification and uh, regression pro problems? And supervised learning for dimensionality reduction and clustering, reinforcement learning, or well suited, uh, best suited for gaming mostly. So the general process of machine learning can be summarized in the following steps. So any machine learning algorithm or to build the machine learning uh, machine learning model, we need to have these, we need to follow these points. First, you should understand the domain. So you can consult the domain experts. Suppose if you are uh, designing a machine learning model for in healthcare, say for a particular uh, disease, Say cancer detection, we should uh, consult the cancer uh, ex cancer expert. So what uh, how what are the characters or what are the symptoms that identify a particular cancer? So we need to construct a domain. First understand the domain and then uh, you acquire knowledge on that particular domain. And then data integration. Data may come from different sources. We need to integrate, select the relevant data, clean because there may be noise involved. So you need to clean and then uh, pre-process. Pre-processing may also involve filling the missing values. And then construct the model, learn the model. After constructing the model, you need to interpret and validate the results using standard metrics. Finally, when you are uh, satisfied with the performance of the model, you consolidate and deploy the discovered knowledge. So how do you represent the knowledge acquired using machine learning? So in the form of decision trees or set of if then rules or in terms of graphical models or neural networks, support vector machines, etc. These are the various uh, ways of representing knowledge. Representing knowledge learned by a machine learning model. So these are the common evaluation metrics, accuracy, precision recall, squared error, Entropy and then this uh, KL divergence. So the process flow of any machine learning algorithm can be visualized or be uh, represented as a five process: get data, clean, train the model, test the data, and then finally deploy. Now, what is deep learning? So today it's an, uh, this session focus on the two important uh, concepts of artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning. So far, we discussed what is machine learning. Now, what is deep learning? How does it differ from machine learning? So deep learning is a variant of machine learning. So it provides deeper insight into data. So how? By multiple hierarchical abstractions of data. So it uh, extracts, as I said earlier, in machine learning, so acquiring intelligence, so or, or we can say learning. So learning is acquisition of intelligence. How does a model learn from the abstractions of data? So here deep learning, it provides deeper insight. It gives deeper insight about the data. How? By multiple, hierarchical, one by one. So it provides, uh, it learns data layer wise. So the first layer may learn only the lines the second layer may identify corners and then the third layer may learn some uh, say if you consider a face just a path of face and then the la final layer may say that it is a face right so each layer will learn something uh, learn a part of the given image so by learn uh, some features so multiple hierarchical learning of features that is deep learning so normally the most common uh, method uh, implemented for deep learning is artificial neural networks it is well suited for prediction detection and generation so the difference between machine learning and deep learning will be in machine learning we have a separate phase for feature extraction the features are given to the classification model Whereas in deep learning, it's a black box. We just give the input, feature extraction and classification is are integrated as a single component. Finally, the model outputs whether it is a car or it's not, it's not a car. 
but in the machine learning we just there's a an original phase feature extraction so the three main areas where machine learning and deep learning can be applied are detection prediction and generation normally this generation so based on the existing patterns we generate new so based on these uh, so the, uh, different images your model may come out with a new image so normally in a, uh, english movies they just generate new images for the characters so that could be done with this generation there are new networks now generated adversarial networks generative uh, adversarial networks and variational auto encoders for this generation process and the detection your text and speech recognition suppose if you speak your model will say that uh, you are speaking and what you are speaking and then image interpretation whether it is a face or other it's a house or it's a car and then human behavior so you are deep and that's uh, that's where the potential of artificial intelligence lies so just by looking at your face you may ask uh, your uh, if you have a robot for that it may ask why are you so sad why are you happy just by looking at your uh, face so human behavior and then fraud detection and then prediction may recommend recover uh, we use for recommendations product recommendations movie recommendation right and then uh, predicting the behavior of human beings etc so that's a fascinating applications of uh, artificial intelligence so again uh, listed so many applications in science manufacturing uh, marketing and sales finance in banking security engineering agriculture education and entertainment so we can say that there is no field where artificial intelligence have uh, is missing so have not penetrated so almost it has uh, it has set its footpath in all the domains so we, we may wonder why it has taken off now so we know that artificial intelligence dates back to 1950s but why it has taken off now because now we are uh, there are <coughs> there is availability of drove uh, high powerful gpus so more computing power and then we know that with the social media and then all as all our applications are digitized there is abundance of data there is plenty of data so because of uh, massive availability of data uh, due to this uh, mobiles smart uh, mobiles and smart appliances and then we have powerful algorithms deep learning applications so the we are release and development of new algorithms apis and platforms for deep learning application so all these three contribute to the popularization of artificial intelligence in recent decades so what is an artificial neural network so the basic uh, so the basic uh, principle or uh, the basic uh, model used for deep learning is artificial neural networks actually it is analogous to our human brain how it works so how it uh, how our brain work we have a set of dendrites so dendrites are the inputs the cell processor our body is the cell uh, cell body is a processor and then again it branches out so the output will be a single axon we call it as the output so again this axon branches out and connects to the next ax uh, neuron so a set of neurons so our uh, artificial neural network is based on is uh, analogous to our human nervous system <coughs> basically <coughs> you could see that the dendrites receives inputs from other neurons and then they all the cell body it changes its internal state based on the activation from the dendrites so if the dendrites so based on the uh, activation so if uh, activation is positive so there will be a threshold so the activation is based on the threshold so the collective input from the dendrites based on a threshold it activates the neuron 
So the activation will be sent to the output. Again, that will be spread up with the, or it will be communicated to the next set of neurons. So this is the basic idea of any neuron model. It receives input from other neurons, changes its internal state based on the current input, and sends one output signal to many other neurons. So if you uh, pictorially represent, we have the inputs, say x1, x2, to XM. So these X1, X2, they are all inputs. So in case of machine, uh, suppose if you want to predict the uh, house price, these features may be uh, like uh, square feet and the number of rooms and then proximity to uh, amenities. Right? Or if it is uh, it's a prediction model for disease, the disease symptoms will be the inputs. And then we give weights. We assign weights to each input. Say, for example, in house, pr house price prediction, if you give importance to proximity to amenities, then that particular uh, input will be given more uh, priority than, given more weight than its square foot, right? So the parameters are assigned some weights based on the priority and then a collective activation. So this multiplied x, x into w, you could say that the summation of x1, w1, plus x2, w2, and up to there are m inputs. So collectively give the output y. So this is the basic function of any neural network. Given the inputs, it is multiplied by its respective weights. And then when the output, we find the summation, but the activation, there is one activation function in between. When the summation exceeds a particular threshold value, then we provide the output. So that is uh, similar to the activation of any neuron. So input multiplied by weights gives the summation. So when the summation based on a given threshold, it uh, activates the neuron. So that's the output. Normally, there are three types of layers, input layer, hidden layer, and output layer. So the input layer represents the input hidden layer. So this hidden layer is responsible for extracting the features from the input data. There may be more than one hidden layer. So all the inputs are fed into the model through this layer. The hidden layers, they are responsible for extracting the required features. So depending upon the depth of the network, that's why we call it as deep learning. So there will be several hidden layers given the input each hidden layer will perform will perform some uh, feature extraction. The output layer is the data after processing. So that's a simple example. These are the parameters, inputs given to a neural network, say X1, X1 corresponds to screen size, X2 corresponds to hardest size, processor speed, RAM size, battery. All these inputs, and then we have a bias, always a bias will be taken as one. So this bias is an additional component. So it uh, helps the model to fit the data in a best way. So finally, we get Z1. What is Z1? Z1 is the multiplier summation of this uh, product of weight and the inputs. X1, W1, plus X2, W2, plus X3, W3, etc. So uh, this activation function based on the Z1, based on some threshold. So we have different activation functions. So depending upon our application, we can choose the appropriate activation function. So when the this activation function activates the neuron, so the output will be the cost of the computer. So this is a simple process. Given the inputs, find the summation, give it to the activation function. So the activation function decides whether to fire a neuron or whether to produce an output or not. So the formula could be given as this G is the activation function, W transpose X, that is the multiplication of inputs with the weights plus bias, B, uh, B refers to the bias. So when you talk about features for different applications, I have listed some of the features. If you want to predict the house price, what are the features? You may need a uh, number of rooms, the area, pollution, distance from amenities, economic index, etc. For spam detection, we have a set of features. So only these features determine the label. 
whether it is a spam or not. And then for speech recognition, for cancer detection, cyber attacks, video recommendations. For image classification, mostly we use the pixel values because the pixel values will be used for finding whether it is an edge or whether it's a part of an image, a part of a component, or uh, etc. Now weights correspond to each feature. As I said, the weights denote the importance of each feature. How much that feature matters in the model. If you assign a higher weight to a particular feature, means that is uh, more important in deciding the outcome of the model. And then we have bias. So in the formula, we uh, had a parameter B that stands for the bias. So the bias value allows the activation function to be shifted to the left or right to better fit the data. So uh, precisely, the bias is used to, it helps the model to best fit the input data. So it could be tuned just like weights. You know that we so actually the model, the performance of the model is improved or it, uh, you say uh, the performance of the model is uh, fine tuned by changing the parameters, by fine tuning the parameters like weights and biases. I told you if uh, the summation or the collective input to a neuron will be activated. When does it activate? So there are different activation functions. So activation function decides whether a neuron should be activated or not based on the weighted sum. So the formula is G of W transpose X plus B. So that G is the activation function. Normally we have linear and nonlinear activation functions, but we if we use linear function that will not give you any, that will not result in any learning because for a particular input, we know that for a particular value of x, the output will be, will be proportional to the value of x. But there are applications where the data is unstructured. So we need to learn the nonlinear relationship among the data. So for such applications, we need to use special activation functions. So without activation function, so what is the purpose of activation function in a neural network? It does the nonlinear transformation. To the input so that helps in learning and performing more complex tasks so it will be it will help in learning unstructured data relationships unstructured data or relationships among unstructured data like images audio video text etc so these are some of the common activation functions used sigmoid function Actually, sigmoid function, it gives you the output, it may it gives you either zero for binary classification. Sigmoid function is mostly used for uh, classification, tan h, relu, rectify linear unit. We have softmax function, it's used for multi-class classification. We have leaky relu, tan sig, log sig. So it's uh, so many, so these are all uh, some uh, directions for uh, new research. We can design your own activation function. So that will introduce novelty to your research work. So a sigmoid function is plotted as an S graph. So the output will be 0 or 1. So it, sorry, it ranges between 0 to 1. So the formula for sigmoid function is sigma of WTX plus B, where sigma is defined as 1 divided by 1 plus e power minus z. So it's a well suited for binary classification. So the sigmoid function is mostly used for binary classification. So don't worry about this mathematical part. You should know what is the purpose. When do you use sigmoid function? And then we have tan h. It's more preferred than sigmoid function because of its range of values. So the range will be between minus 1 to plus 1. It's a, we can say that it's a shifted version of sigmoid function. Relu, it's the most uh, popularly used activation function. It stands for rectified linear unit. And then uh, it's uh, given us max of 0, x. Right? 
So what do you mean by this function? All negative values are turned to zero. So it gives an output x if x is positive, otherwise zero. So all negative values are squashed to zero. So this ReLU learns much faster than sigmoid and other damage functions. Most popular uh, activation function that is used in convolutional neural network. Hope uh, you may uh, you may have a lecture on convolutional neural network. So they are well suited for uh, image classification. So softmax function is also a type of sigmoid function and uh, used for classification problems. But here the softmax function can handle multiple classes. So it is used for multi-class classification. So it gives you the probabilities. Suppose if you give the cat image, so if you an image, it gives you the probability like uh, like uh, 0.1% to dog, it resembles dog, or 0.2% it resembles car, and then say 0.6% it resembles a cat. So it assigns different probabilities to different classes. So when uh, when you put a threshold, so when the probability is above 0.7, then that is the class label. So if we given the cat image, if its probability for cat is uh, more than 0.6, it is classified as 0.6. Right? So this uh, softmax function is used for multi-class classification. If the number of classes is 2, then softmax reduces to logistic regression. Normally, logistic regression, it gives either 0 or 1. It's used for binary prediction. So how does the, how does the neural network learn? So it learns by trial and error. So given the inputs, you compute the uh, weighted sum. You pass it on through activation function, right? You compute the error. You propagate the error again to the inputs by fine tuning, uh, either changing the weights. So this process continues until the error is minimized. So it's a continuous process of trial, processing an input to produce an output, evaluate, and then adjust the weights. So the error function is computed using this formula that is a derivative of the output minus the target value. So this is the actual output we get. Target is the so this is the uh, computed output. This is the actual output. Y target is the actual output. We find the difference, square difference, and then take a derivative. So the commonly used error function is the mean squared error function, which is given here. So we try to minimize the mean squared error each time. So this uh, iteratively we try until the mean squared error is uh, below a threshold. So the, all the green lines give, uh, show you the forward propagation, how the inputs are fed, uh, summation, and then activate, activated. What is the final output? And then the difference between the final output and the actual output is measured. Error is calculated, and then the error is propagated backwards. So back propagation adjusts the weights of neural network in order to minimize the network's total mean squared error. So this is how a neural network. So, so far we have discussed how a neural network works. So the, the basic principle of a neural network. Now we have a gradient. So normally the neural networks, they uh, come across this vanishing gradient problem. So what is a gradient? So a gradient measures how much the output of a function changes when you change the input. So this van uh, <coughs> gradient will be uh, based on the gradient will be adjusting the weights. So while adjusting the weights, we've uh, come across this vanishing gradient problem. So when the gradient becomes very small, then learning is also will be very less. So there should be a gradual learning of uh, gradual decrease in the gradients. So that is a problem of vanishing gradients. We can uh, use ReLU function or some other uh, activation functions for eliminating this vanishing gradient problem. Another important thing uh, in the neural network, another important concept in a neural network is optimizing function. So optimizing function 
what is its uh, sorry its function is to optimize the performance of the model so optimizing functions are used to optimize the performance of the model so we have several optimization techniques gradient descent traditional batch gradient descent stochastic gradient descent so the difference is so gradient descent is used to do weight update based on so so that we minimize the loss function so same gradient descent traditional batch what we do is we just calculate the gradient for batches we divide the data set into several batches and then we calculate the gradient and then we'll be per, we calculate the gradient for different batches but update will be only once in stochastic gradient they performs they will so, uh, stochastic gradient descent perform parameter update for each training example only one performs one update at a time so for every uh, every iteration an update is made so here it maintains a single learning rate for all weight updates so that is the difference between traditional batch gradient and stochastic gradient descent here the weight update will be once but in stochastic it will be performed one for every training sample and then we have variants of gradient descent mini mini batch gradient descent and then uh, it takes the uh, best of both techniques so here the update so you could see through two extremes the traditional uh, gradient descent method it works it considers the whole data set as a single batch so it will perform a weight update only once in uh, the previous one that is a traditional batch gradient descent so it performs update only once but in case of mini batch we divide into several mini batches it uh, performs an update for every batch with the n training samples in each batch adam is the most uh, popular optimization algorithm it's adaptive moment uh, algorithm so uh, it, it maintains a learning rate for each weight so normally a learning rate will be maintained for the entire model but in adaptive moment a learning rate is maintained for each weight so this uh, helps in learning faster so how do you construct how do you decide on your network neural network structure we have two approaches so the network structure decides so uh, how do you decide the network structure you have to choose the number of layers and neurons so the number of layers and the number of neurons in each layer depend on the particular task so we have we can follow two approaches either start from a large network and successively remove some neurons or it's a top down approach the first one is a top down approach second one is bottom up approach you begin with a small network you begin with small uh, set of neurons and small uh, number of layers and then slowly you add the complexity until you uh, reach the desired performance so normally we have different types of neural networks a simple perceptron there is no hidden layer and then feed forward neutron the feed forward uh, network we have one hidden layer and then we have radial basis networks these are also feed forward networks so recurrent neural networks so here recurrent neural networks we have two types of cells so here the most it is used for uh, time series data for processing time for working on time series data where here the each cell will memorize the previous uh, input so that is uh, <coughs> normally for uh, speech recognition for natural language processing recurrent neural networks are the best and then a variant of rnn that is lstm it introduces an additional cell with three types of gates so this lstm networks can process video frames so they can remember many video frames so that they can learn they can uh, recognize a particular video so normally this is used for video recognition given a video you know that a video is a set of uh, frames frame uh, sequence of frames 
so only if it remembers the previous frame it will uh, can grasp what uh, what is the relevance what is the relationship or how what actually that uh, uh, video is meant for so that uh, for that we'll be using this lstm and then gru gated recurrent unit it has special uh, two types of case only two types of case update gates and reset gates so the most popular network is convolutional neural network it's a class of deep neural network why do you say it's a deep neural network because it has more number of uh, hidden layers and it also uses a special filter you can go otherwise call it as a kernel which extracts features so there will be multiple kernels each kernel learns a particular type of feature so all these features put together finally the network convolution neural network will be used for recog object recognition or for classification so if you consider this image recognition the first layer may detect the gradient you know what is the gradient the sudden change in the intensity value or edges the second line second uh, layer may detect lines the third layer may detect shapes finally the object so convolutional neural network is the most popular type of neural network and it has a wide variety of applications so an example of a deep neural uh, network that is convolutional neural network you could see the input layer image we are giving an image the first hidden layer detects edges edges that is gradients second layer detects some shapes or line and then third layer they detect the object itself so the design issues and research prospects in artificial intelligence we can try with initial weights because normally weights are chosen randomly and then we have to choose the appropriate activation function and then how to estimate error how to adjust weights and then how do you decide on the number of neurons based on your application how do you represent data right and then three important uh, problems issues normally we face when you are designing your model that is overfitting and underfitting so overfitting is the model memorizes the data suppose if the day training set size the size of the training set is very low the model memorizes the data so it gives better good uh, prediction or recognition only for those data if we give a new data it may not be able to identify correctly so that is uh, overfitting so if for uh, avoiding overfitting you need to increase the training set so uh, low training set error so uh, actually overfitting will be low training set error and high test set error because the model is trained only to the training set as the training set size is low underfitting is high training set error but high both both errors are high so this underfitting is a very uh, crucial problem that should not be uh, faced by any model good fit is low training set error low test set error so we have very uh, several popular networks linet it was it was the first network designed in uh, created in 1990 followed by alexnet zfnet google net etc resnet inception v3 model and mobile net now we have unet vnet there are so many models now in the market so what are the applications of artificial intelligence we have it could be very well applied in image image classification that is a car or not classification with localization car we say that it is a car and it is located so using bounding rectangles detection we detect multiple cars in the same image not one single car here it detects multiple objects so these are several examples artificial intelligence can be used for a product recommendation system book recommendation right so what are the essential tool, tools work uh, so uh, github is the is the best uh, repository of all uh, tools algorithms etc so uh, to uh, if anyone want, wants to start 
your AI research, you just visit the first uh, thing to do is to visit GitHub. So uh, all uh, machine learning and deep learning algorithms can be very well developed using Python, Jupyter Notebooks. We have special utilities, special library files for uh, numeric calculations for handling data structures and plotting graphs, etc. So these are the repositories where you can find the data sets for UCAML repository, Kaggle, Mendeley, etc. And then these are the frameworks that you can use for uh, developing uh, machine learning and deep learning applications. So these are the references. So the, today's takeaways from this lecture, or you have an, an overview of uh, machine learning and deep learning networks and their applications. So thank you. If you have any questions, you can ask. Good afternoon, ma'am. This is Sangeet Kanni. Yeah, madam. Uh, ma'am, when we do multi-layer perceptron, uh, in hidden layer, we can do uh, pre-processing, future selection, classification. Is it possible in hidden layer, ma'am? Yes, actually, the purpose of using hidden layers is for feature extraction. Can we do pre-processing or classification in the hidden layer, ma'am? No, actually, uh, we, when you are using a neural network, we cannot modify the hidden layers. So that is a black box concept. Once you give the input, we get the output. But now a new field is emerging. Did you uh, listen to the first talk, madam? By uh, no, later on, only I joined, ma'am. Oh, that's an interesting uh, lecture. So recently, we uh, go for explainable AI. Oh, okay. Explainable AI where we just uh, the model so here we just feed the inputs you get the output but we don't know what happens inside the network but that explainability is uh, incorporated nowadays in explainable AI. so why the model has resulted why the model has given this particular decision so uh, we just uh, trace through the layers so the number of hidden layers that could be decided based on your application so each hidden layer performs a particular uh, feature extraction. Okay. The number of nodes, uh, how do we decide the uh, number of nodes in the layer? Man? So that is the research uh, topic. So the number of nodes, see if you have uh, each network. So I listed my, some networks, right? Like say as ResNet, uh, Inception Net, et cetera, UNet, VNet, et cetera. They have uh, pre-designed uh, number of nodes and uh, layers. So each network has, a, the, has their own set of layers and uh, neurons. But if you want to do novelty, you can try to change the number of neurons and then change the number of layers. That is also a, a good uh, research direction. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So any queries from participants? So thank you, ma'am, for your wonderful deliverable presentation. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Okay. So participants, thank you can ask me assemble at uh, 2 p.m. for the third session. So now it's lunchtime from 1 to 2.